Good evening, or afternoon, as the case may be. Once again, you're listening to the hour of the time, and uh, I'm still William Cooper. President William Jefferson Clinton called me the most dangerous radio host in America in a White House memo which Rush Limbaugh read on the air on his excellence in broadcasting network. You know, the network that spends all its time calling the president names and never identifies the real enemy or gives you real solutions to the real problems which we face, which is the destruction of this nation, the destruction of all of the things that we've always valued, and the bringing into existence of a socialist, totalitarian New World Order, which I have documented over many, 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 many hundreds, even thousands of hours of radio broadcasting on the hour of the time. Today we're going to take you to May 28, 1998, which was day four of our annual conference, and you're going to hear a lecture by Mr. Miles Gilbert, who is an archaeologist, a good friend of mine who lives in the Round Valley of Arizona, and uh, he's going to set you straight on ancient Indian cultures, uh, who they were, what were the messages that they left in the pictographs and uh, in the rock paintings, and uh, what did it really mean? I think you're going to find it extremely interesting. Miles is uh, <laughs> is afflicted with a sort of a dry humor, much like the English. He is engaging, he is funny, he uh, will educate you, and uh, he's, uh, he's a hell of a nice guy. Miles believes in the Constitution for the United States of America. He believes in the right to keep and bear arms. He believes the right to freedom of religion. Miles is a Christian. Miles is, uh, is one of those people who, when it comes time to give up your arms, is not going to give up anything. Unless it's bullets first, just like me. So, please listen, and uh, I hope you learn something, because uh, almost everything that he discusses during his lecture, and you're going to hear again, you know, tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but Monday, uh, from Miles, almost everything that he discusses as far as ruins, ancient Indian cultures, uh, pictographs, pictograms, uh, the things that he is talking about are all located within one mile to three or four miles from my home. And uh, while I knew that some of them existed, I was not in any way cognizant of the majority of what he is discussing uh, during this lecture. And, but I have made it a point to go and see some of them. And before uh, this year is up, I'm going to see every single ruin and and uh, ancient uh, um, message that the that the uh, the Native Americans who lived long before we ever came here left um, for the posterity of the world to see. And I hope that uh, those of you listening in the Round Valley will also do the same. So, without further ado, my good friend and my neighbor, Mr. Miles Gilbert. Are you ready? Hey. Well, I'm going to bring up the mark here so we can have a little space for editing if you need a minute. And a minute on the end. It doesn't matter what's in that space. You just read it for camera roll, for editor roll. Uh, Miles is 
my good friend. I met him. He was driving around looking for a house. And he drove up on my mountain, and there was a lot there that for sale sign, and he mistakenly thought that we owned the whole mountain, and, and uh, knocked on the door, and we invited him in and showed him around all that kind of stuff. We've been friends ever since. Miles is an archaeologist. Um, he works mainly in the uh, northeastern and east central areas of Arizona. His specialty is uh, uh, Indian cultures and ancient Native American cultures and remains and, and uh, sites and all that kind of stuff. So what I'm asking to do, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about what his specialty is, his educational background. Uh, what I'm asking to do is to come and, and uh, share with you some of his knowledge and sort of help dispel some of the myths that are floating around out there about where the ancient Indians came from and what they're trying to say in the with us and what their culture really was. The sort of... Uh, cut through all the bullshit that's being fostered by the New Age and the UFO community and everybody has some kind of agenda that want to use this to steer us in some way away from the truth. And, and if anybody in this world can do it, Miles can do it. So, without any further ado, would you please give him a big <laughs> I thought I was here to do Shakespeare's Hamlet. <laughs> well, maybe you are. <laughs> Phil didn't say that I was educated beyond my intelligence for the time I left in third grade. But a smart person would not get three degrees in anthropology, and I did, so that shows it right there. I wasn't too right. I was well on my way to being a, an applied entomologist at the University of Kansas. And the university required some classes in social sciences in order to graduate. So, for those my parents had collected a cigar box full of arrowheads on their ranch in the Texas Panhandle, and I wanted to know, and I'll laugh some of the taxis and I'll do online, I don't know what crime it is, maybe they'd rather get it. So, I took that box of arrowheads over to the university and signed up for an archaeology class and made a hard turn away from applied entomology. I'd probably be the level of government to by now if I stayed with applied entomology, but I've enjoyed my career as an archaeologist very much. The University of Kansas also required two foreign languages for graduation, and being from the Texas Panhandle, I thought college English ought to satisfy one requirement, but it didn't. So I took Spanish, which has served me well in Peru, Guatemala, and Mexico as an archaeologist. But the committee wanted me to think German, and I was sure in my heart that I would never need German, didn't need to read German, didn't want to speak German, didn't like German. Excuse me. Didn't like what they did in the Second World War. Anyway, so I campaigned upon the committee to let me do comparative osteology. That is, how to identify the bones of critters that are found in archaeological context or otherwise. So I got a master's in archaeology. The thesis title was actually longer than the body of the thesis. It was some uh, aspects of diet and butchery techniques among priest Indians in South Dakota. And then I did a PhD in applied forensic osteology. I worked for the various uh, police officials identifying the bodies of homicide victims and that sort of thing, which brings us to the first point I want to make this afternoon, and that is that our Native Americans, the people that we just call Indians, are actually related to folks from Asia. And they got here a very long time ago, perhaps 13,000 years ago. There was a bridge, what we call the Bering Land Bridge, between here and northeastern Asia. During the ice age, a great deal of seawater was taken up in the form of glaciers, and so the sea level was lowered by about 300 feet, 100 meters, give or take. And lowering the sea level that much then established a land bridge between northeastern Asia and northwestern North America. And a lot of the animals that we find here actually are migrants out of Asia. Elephants, for instance. The oldest elephants are found over in Asia and Africa. And the oldest buffalo, uh, the see the skull of one hand up there on the wall. Those are, of course, actually bison. The Latin name is bison, bison, bison. In case you didn't get it the first time, it was bison, bison, bison. 
I had two off great ladies speaking with me in Costa Mall Pines this summer. I wasn't until recently directed in Costa Mall Pines so I could watch the program on Springville. And I informed the ladies that these animals are actually bison and not buffalo, such as are found in Australia and Africa. And these ladies told me with a perfectly straight face that in Australia, a bison is what you watch your bison. <laughs> so, our Native Americans have a number of physical characters in common with people from Asia. First of all, we talk about Native Americans or Indians having high cheekbones, who are not higher than those from any other racial group. They're simply more prominent laterally. A Native American skull is probably widest across the cheekbones, across what we call the zygomatic arches here. Whereas those of you who are descendants of Europeans, your skull is probably widest somewhere above and behind your ears up in there. So Native Americans have very wide zygomatic arches, wide cheekbones. Not high, but wide. Also, Native Americans have relatively flat faces, that is to say, the face doesn't come out in a point the way it does in those of us who are of European descent. I'll illustrate that by putting this pencil across the base of this chap's nose. And you'll notice that the maxilla and cheekbone protrude so far anteriorly that there's not space for me to get my index finger between the pencil and the cheekbone. I'll compare that now with this guy of European descent. By the way, everybody has white bones, so this guy is called with brown simply because whoever dug him up by the uh, Canaan to Arizona happened to put a coat of shellac on him. So we put the pencil across the, the base of the nose of this dude, and you can see there is space to get my finger almost between the cheekbone and the pencil. What I'm trying to say is that those of us from Europe have faces that are built kind of like the prow of the ship. We're kind of pre-adapted for sticking our noses in other people's business. <laughs> At least that seems to have been our foreign policy for the last couple hundred years. <laughs> Another racial trait that is different between Native Americans and uh, Anglos or Europeans is that we have a very well-developed nasal cell. There is a dam or ridge of bone here at the front of the nose. And if uh, you don't think it's too gross, so you can take your little finger and palpate right there. And if you have one, you will feel a ridge or dam or bone. Now, this Native American, on the other hand, does not have one. You can see that there is not a dam or ridge or bone at the front. What this would be useful for if you were a runner, this would kind of like be having a supercharger on your automobile engine, you can get more air in quickly. If we look at the ear hole of a Native American, rarely is it possible to see another hole down inside. That other hole is called the oval window. It is a natural, a naturally occurring foramen in the middle here. Everybody has one. It's just that the ear hole of a Native American is shaped differently from those from Europe. And so, uh, if you get an opportunity later, you want to come up with the things you may. Uh, look in the air hole and you'll be able to see the open window uh, in this white gun. The oldest racial trait that is known is the shovel-shaped incisor, that is to say the enamel on the two front teeth, especially, is curved round on the side uh, in a scoop-like fashion. Think about the little scoop that you have down at the grocery store. Maybe you buy your coffee beans in bulk or your granola or your chocolate, whatever it is. The little scoop has ridges on the side, okay? I want to pass these around. These are some central incisors from Native Americans, and you can see that the enamel does indeed curl around on the side. Make for a very, very strong tooth. If the assumptions we make about radiometric dating are correct, then people lived in the caves of Togo Dan, just outside of Beijing, or what we call Peking, China. They lived there about 450,000 years ago, and they had shovel shaped inside. That's why I say that's the oldest racial trait that is known. Bill didn't say anything to me about this next aspect that I'm going to talk about, but I just wouldn't feel right if I didn't. Uh, um, I don't know if I talked to you about sex. But I can talk to you about gender, so I want to talk about some cranial characters that enable us forensic osteologists to determine the gender of the deceased. First of all, 
both these chaps are chaps, they're both males, and so what I'm going to tell you is true of both training. I'll use this one because it's more complete. First of all, the male cranium has a bigger brow ridge. We have a bigger bar of bone above our eyes than do females. And secondly, the forehead, the frontal bone, slopes backward on the male as compared to the female. Okay? We have a female would be more vertical like this rather than sloping back. And after almost 30 years of marriage, I finally discovered why the male forehead slopes back. <laughs> was this your birthday? Did I forget our anniversary again? Also, the male orbits tend to be square cornered, whereas the, the edges, the margins of the female orbit are more round, so the males are more square cornered. And males tend to have a bigger masculine process. If you take your finger and poke around behind your ear, you will find a lump of bone back there. This term mastoid is from the root mastos, which has to do with being cone-shaped. And I'll tell you this because after a while I'm going to talk about mastodonts, which were extinct elephants that had cone-shaped cusps on their teeth. So this is a cone-shaped hunk of bone, and you have one of these unless you had a mastoid Equity, not to be confused with a mastectomy, which is the current removal of the breast, but they are both cone shaped structures. Okay. Also, men tend to have bigger muscle markings. Now, this is less true than it used to be. Uh, if you have noticed going through the checkout line of the grocery store, you've probably seen muscle building magazines, and there have been photographs of women on the covers of those who obviously could wrestle me into the dust. And until I met my wife, I was one of would. But, <laughs> Men tend to have bigger muscle markings than, than females, unless the female happens to be a weak builder. The mandible, the lower jaw, is another piece of evidence to determine gender. This mandible does not belong to either of these uh, skulls, but I will place it on this one just to show you another Native American character. Virtually everybody in here has an overbite. That is to say, that's your state. Does your upper teeth overlap your lower teeth? Okay. Most of you have an overbite. Native Americans have an edge to edge bite, such that the upper teeth and the lower teeth come together in the front. And that would be true of this individual and this individual, even though they're not the same individual. You can see that they have to sit together, so they would have either of them would have an edge to edge bite. Okay, but back to gender differences. This is called the, the gonial angle of the mandible. So this is the horizontal ramus, and this is the vertical or ascending ramus, and where they come together, they make an angle. In the human female, this angle is obtuse. Remember ge geometry, this is an obtuse angle, whereas in the human male, this would be much more of a right angle, okay, more of a right angle more obtuse in a human female. Now, you may have wondered why this guy has some extra holes in his head, and uh, I would like to explain that. I was head of the Human Identification Laboratory at the University of Missouri Columbia in 1980 when this guy came into the lab. He didn't come in by himself. He came in with the Missouri Highway Patrol, and they wanted to know if he'd been shot in the head, and I said, no. <laughs> First of all, both of these holes are bigger on the outside than they are on the inside. So if either of them was a bullet hole, it would be an accident hole. It would be blown bone out, so the hole would be bigger on the outside than on the inside. But the real giveaway is that both margins are, are very smooth. And this hole actually has a little spur of bone growing across it. So the bottom line is this guy had these holes inserted into his head long before he died. He was actually in the process of healing. Bone was growing across the hole when he finally met his death. Turns out that he was only 53 years old. I'm now 55, so only 53 is significant to me. He was really young. He was very young. <laughs> he was only 53. He was uh, found by the Missouri Highway Patrol in a vacant lot in Jefferson City, Missouri. And well, when I told him what I knew about him, they began to look into their records and discovered he had been a prisoner in the penitentiary in Jeff City, Missouri. He had been involved in a riot and received uh, an attitude adjustment 
a bilateral attitude adjustment. And Bruce McKay's, of course, because he had any medical people on here. Mm-hmm. You, know, you all know the term subdural hematoma, alias the blood clot on the brain. Um, of course, this is the frontal lobe, which is where rational thought occurs. And I'm glad you brought that to my attention because the other point we can make with regard to the female forehead being more vertical, it's obvious that women are pretty adapted for greater capacity for rational thought than men are. It just may be that some men have wondered why some women have not displayed greater capacity for rational thought, but I would not be one of those. <laughs> so, he had perfect headaches, and these trepanation holes were introduced to relieve the pressure of the subdural hematoma or blood clot. And the guy served his time, got out, and died probably of congestive heart failure out there. Now, I want to see how much you've learned already, and you have. You'll be surprised how much you know. A few months ago, I got a box of bones from Mojave County Sheriff's Office, and there was only a thing about a gallon of gas can. It was that body of bones, and all the bones were burned, all of them were broken. And those that were the least burned and the least broken were those of the dog. Obviously, Rover was dead all over. <laughs> but in that box were four human bones. One of them was a, a tailless or a scrapless, an ankle bone. One was the, uh, the middle digit of, of the fourth finger. I was going to be careful which finger I stick up so nobody's offended. Anyway, uh, the third bone that was human was from the, the middle of the skull over to about there, the upper left margin of the, of the left orbit. And it had a well-developed brown ridge, had a square corner, the dome margin, which I didn't mention. As many times as I've given this talk, I'm always leaving something out. And I just remembered that the female orbit tends to be more sharply margin, have a sharper edge to it than the male does. Okay, so what gender do we have? We have a male. And the fourth color man was from the midline over to about where the canine tooth inserts and had a very well-developed nasal fill, so what grades did we have? And the Europeans, see how much you learned? You guys can go work in the police department now. Learned a whole lot in a very short time. The problem with the uh, case of the defense was, and speaking of cases, there was the nice 9 millimeter case in with the bones, and the skull happened to own the grounding high power and put it with a silencer. And he had three fully automatic spin machine guns, and he was a machinist, and he had burned up the deceased and the dog of the deceased with magnesium. You can generate a perfectly hot fire uh, with, with magnesium. But he said, his defense was, oh, those bones were uh, my late wife. I had her cremated. Well, two problems with that. First of all, the gender. And second, when your crematorium does a much more efficient job of burning the human skeleton. Uh, and the little punkers that he had done. So, question or comment about this before we look at the kind of animals that were here on the Colorado Plateau to share the environment with our, our Native Americans. Sir? That penitentiary, they drove two holes in the let off the blood pressure? Yes, sir. And that's how they did it? Well, that's the way anybody would do it. Any surgeon would do that with that, that kind of damage. Yeah, I had terrific headaches, except I would have taken care of it. Yeah. Anything else? Even prisons have real doctors. <laughs> Which is not always what you should be saying. I'm not trying to read you that but not necessarily sober ones. <laughs> the real one we're going to do about the being able to see these slides. Uh, well, let's see how they turn out. Is that focused? Yeah. Wasn't that a wonderful lunch? Yeah. My compliments to the cooks. We ready? Yeah. Sir. Okay. This slide, of course, represents North and South America. In the upper left hand corner, you can see. A radiocarbon date of 27,000 years ago. That is taken from a caribou tibia. That would be the shin bone out of a caribou. And it was modified by people, modified to become a height scraper. And it certainly is close to the 30,000 year margin at the moment. The anthropologists accept is what is probably the earliest date for the population 
of the new world from the old. Men and women out of Asia chasing the elephants and buffalo and so forth to get over here. You will see some other dates, like down in South America, we have 14 and 16,000, 14,000 people were down in Sierra del Fuego by certainly 12,000 years ago. Now, these people specialized in hunting mammoths, and I want to show you some slides from a site at the north edge of the Colorado Plateau, where the Madison limestone formation is about 900 feet thick. And when the Laramide orogeny occurred, that would be the uplifting of the Rocky Mountain chain. That occurred about 70 million years ago, if it would take a week. This limestone, which of course represents an ocean bottom, that limestone was uplifted and it cracked and groundwater percolated through the cracks resulted in the creation of caves. And here is one that uh, trapped a great number of animals. If you can think about the cave, the same old cave along a major game trail, and during the ice age there was a lot more vegetation uh, than there is currently in that area. Animals simply did not see the hole, and so they fell. Some of them fell onto a pile of snow and ice, some of the predators did, and survived the fall to starve to death. They chewed on the bones of animals that were already in there. Here we have a situation in June with uh, about eight feet of snow and ice that the animals could fall on nowadays. During the ice age, there must have been a great deal more. Some of you may remember an account of one of our air crew shot down over Germany during the Second World War. His chute, his parachute did not open. He fell 18,000 feet and threw some tree lamps and into a really deep snowbank, and he survived. He didn't walk away from it, but he did survive. He healed up in a prison camp. So, here are some of the kinds of animals that were around uh, during the ice age. Bigger, and human beings are bigger than they were during the ice age. Here is a comparison of a modern ranch horse uh, foot tall and an ice age horse foot tall. Here in the middle of the picture is a horse skull. There's the bony eye ring, uh, the cheek, the upper tooth roll, the front teeth, the nose opening, the top of the, of the skull rim. And this is what it looks like when you get it out and put it back together. I had a paleontological preparator named John Corn, and I brought him a sack full of bones, and he dumped them out and saw that the animal had a long face. He said, Miles, this animal had a long face. What do you want me to make of it? Do you want a camel? Do you want a moose? I said, John has horses' teeth, wants to make a horse out of it. <laughs> The most exciting animal that we found in the course of 11 field seasons was this one, and this is Johnny Corn, only this animal. I mean, can any of you guess what sort of animal that is? Is it a dog? Is it a cat? Is it a wolverine? Anybody want to guess? Yes. It is a cat. In fact, we were so excited when we found this, we offered an article to Science Magazine and uh, Wonder of Wonders that made the cover of Science, March 11, 1977. We said that we had found or made the discovery of, this is the title of the article, the discovery of a cheetah-like cat in the North American Pleistocene. So we had this cheetah-like cat compared to a mountain lion. The mountain lion is a much more uh, robust, stocky, ambush predator, whereas the, the, mountain, the uh, cheetah-like cat would be an active pursuit predator. Well, anybody here remember Samuel Langhorn Clemens, alias Mark Twain? Mr. Twain said there's something fascinating about science. One gets such wholesale returns and conjecture from such a trifling investment in fact. <laughs> we made the cover of Science Magazine and we were wrong. We didn't have cheetah like cats. We had cheetahs. We dug up a bunch more of them after the article was published and we compared them with known cheetahs and there was no difference. Cheetahs. Why do you care? These guys, the ancestors of these guys, we're sharing this environment with a host of pursuit predators, cheetahs, lions, short-faced bears, wolves. 
And I was one of these, one of these dudes. We found two kinds of bus costs in the cave. And who cares about bus costs? The other animals in the Shunga thus far have been predators of uh, grass eaters. These guys today live in the tundra. And so the point of all this is we had uh, evidence of a tundra like environment around there at one time. And this is the dire wall skull. If you go to the Peyton Museum, you'll find an entire wall as big as this wall behind me covered with dire wolf skulls. A lot of them uh, were attracted to the smell of carrying as the page of tar pits, and so they got stuck in the tar. Now, the dire wolf is different from a modern wolf only in that its skull is bigger and its shoulders are bigger. The rest of the body size is the same as a modern wolf. And we had in the same strata, that is, they died at the same time, both modern wolves and dire wolves. The point of this is, the modern wolf did not evolve from dire wolves, the what we call common species. They were alive at the same time. Just as Cro Magnon man, Homo erectus, uh, excuse me, Homo sapiens, was alive at the same time as, as uh, Homo neanderthalensis. Uh, that is to say, that, that we modern people did not evolve from neanderthals. Okay, there were some animals that we did not find because the habitat around that area was not correct. We didn't find stag boots, we didn't find mastodons, we did not find saber-toothed cats. This whole complex of animals would be associated with a brushy environment rather than a tundra or grassland environment. Here's a skull with short-faced bear, and remember he's a long-legged bear, but he's called short-faced because the length of the tooth row is short compared to the length of the tooth row in other bears. We found the red foxes, we also found collared livings, and these are very important animals because whereas as the climate changes, the mammoth in fact is starting to go to Florida. And nobody's awake out there though. If the if the climate changes, this little guy is going to become locally extinct. And he of course today is found only up in the tundra area, up in the Arctic Circle. He's a collared living. We found those also. Here we are digging, and we not only dug up bones, but we also took out of the cave a tremendous amount of dirt that we washed and spread out so we could sort through it and find the bones and teeth of the tiny animals that are reasonably adapted to their environment so we could see how the climate changed or remained the same. Now, the climate around the area today is a, uh, a sagebrush and juniper environment. So what we would find there would be sage grouse and sage mice etc. During the Ice Age, there was a tremendous variety of vegetation, which would have supported that uh, wide variety of animals. This is a rich kind of find that we would make during the course of a week. So we have big horn sheep, cheetah, wolf, horses, camels, tremendous number of things. And the site was important because it's stratified. We have radio carbon dates up there of 10,990 years and 12,000 and 14,000 and 16,000. And we get way on down here to a volcanic gas layer that has two independent things of dating. One is 107,000 years ago and the other 110,000 years ago. And those disagree with each other by less than 3% over the course of time we're talking about. Below this volcanic gas level, is the big horn sheep, and if any of you hunt big horn sheep, you would be, I think, impressed with the size of that animal. The point is, this guy fell into this cave something over 107,000 years ago during what we call the Sangamon Interglacial. And you may have noticed by this time that all the sheep skulls I've shown you are males, and you ladies are thinking, well, of course, the, the females, the youth are too smart to fall in a hole while the ram who button heads fell in. The real reason, of course, is that the ram fell in the hole because he couldn't make a new turn. There's still some people asleep out there, though. Bad. So, the, the fact of the matter is that the male big horn sheep have a separate home range from the ewes and lambs. And so, this cave situation was located where the, the, uh, the ram home range was. When well, we talked about sheep, I want to mention this guy. This is a, an Arctic fox, Halibex lagopus. We also found those. So again, we have a wide variety of fauna representing different climatic episodes in the cave. And this is the last slide of this series. Here we have a giant ground flock 
uh, interacting with some Paleolithic hunters, some uh, Native Americans. Who remembers the name of the third president of the United States? Mark. Oh, that's a Mark. This animal was described from a farm in Virginia, and he was published by the third president of the United States, who, because the animal has nine claws, he thought it was a giant lion, so he named it Mega Lonix, Mega Lonix, giant lion, Mega Lonix Jefferson Lion. Thomas Jefferson published this animal, and uh, they were alive and well right here in the immediate vicinity. We have bones of these critters from here, so our ice age hunters could have interacted with these students right here. Now, before I go on to the next series of slides, I want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions or make comments, because the next series will set the, the ground for our technical talk. Also, if anybody needs to make a potty break, feel free to give me permission to do this, but I know that an empty bladder is a happy bladder. Okay, moving right along. The people who generated the pictographs and petroglyphs in this part of the world were descendants then of the, the earliest Ice Age hunters. We have Native Americans coming over maybe 30,000 years ago, and by 12,000 years ago they were spots south to South America, Tierra del Fuego. Some of them then developed some pretty highly specialized cultures in Middle America, especially Mexico, and then came back up into the Southwest, into Arizona and New Mexico, they were the ancestors of the people we now call Hopi and or Zuni. This site that we're looking at is Pueblo Benito on Chaco Canyon. Uh, this site was built beginning around 8950. Uh, the last tree ring date we have from there indicating uh, abandonment would be uh, uh, about 10, 1070, 1075. People left there then one of the Hopi Mesas, they came over here in Arizona and so forth. This site has 32 circular structures that we call kivas, uh, the religious, if you call it a church, all sort of explanation, but so you can think of it in some sense as a church. The kiva has an internal bench, and it represents one of the levels of emergence, which I will explain momentarily. There are several varieties of architecture at Pueblo Benito. Corn and agriculture was a major means of making living, and the corn then was ground in these big stone bowls we call matantes. Matante is uh, a word in our language derived from a Nahuatl word. Uh, there are some other words in their language that are Nahuatl. Uh, Chapa is one, Pukalau. Uh, the little animal that marks at the moon we call coyotes, that's cord oil. So, this complex at Pueblo Benito was so successful and so widespread, there are outlier villages close by here that have the same culture, they were genetically related to the people who built this site. Now, some of you have been to Canyon to Shade, you mentioned, and we're going to look at a few slides of that. And uh, uh, this, of course, is Spider Woman Rock, part of the Mudloan and part of the Navajo mythology has to do with a creator being known as Spider Woman, and she's basically looked up on top of that rock. Excuse me? Excuse me? I thought Spider Woman was too. Sure. 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 You notice um, how well preserved Pueblo Benito was sitting out in the open and how poorly preserved uh, these sites are, even though they're in this alcove. The difference is this is not a whole sandstone, which simply does weather as well as the Dakota the sandstone that Pueblo Benito was built out of. Okay, the very earliest pictographs, which are painted images, and petroglyphs, which are images that are painted in the rock, the very earliest ones of those date from the archaic period 
uh, several thousand years before the birth of Christ. Those people lived in households like this, but they did not build pueblos. This is a uh, cliff palace. This was discovered by a couple of cowboys. Uh, Richard Weatherell and Charlie Mason found this in, uh, in December of, of 1880. And um, until a bigger one was made in New York City in 1880, uh, this complex was the largest of apartment dwelling in the world. <laughs> Here again, we see some craft structures which were kivas or, uh, or religious structures. Now, getting much closer to home, this is the valley of the Upper Little Colorado. This is the Little Colorado. This is a canyon over by, uh, by Bill's house. My advice is you come over uh, when you have time. When you're done here, if you have time, you're going east, so I run over to, to uh, see the Raven site. A lot of the petroglyphs that I'm going to show you are from this immediate area. And this is a clan symbol. We notice over here that uh, we have on our markers. That is a clan symbol specifically. The sand clan associated with the Hopi. It's also identified as uh, being a marker for, for Venus, and it's a marker for Quetzalcoatl, uh, that bearded Anglo who uh, uh, ostensibly uh, came over back when. Here's a Katsina mask. Katsina cults began about AD 1275. If you can think about being a newcomer to a community, you're going to move into Eager, but you don't know Bill Cooper. You don't have a friend there yet. But you find in that community already established uh, a group that you can relate to. Perhaps you're a member of a particular uh, church congregation. You know, you're a Baptist or Lutheran or something. Uh, maybe you're also a Rotarian or a Kiwanis or a Lions Club. So you have those groups that you can go associate with. Casina calls served in this way. Between 1276 and 1299 was a terrific drought here in the southwest. And people had to migrate. The climate got to be too dry where they were to grow corn. And so they had to move. A lot of the people from the Four Corners area moved up the river in the whole Colorado and they found people already living there. Well, there are two things that could happen. They could fight or they could accept these people. Now, Casino Call operated to incorporate people into the community. The guy who was a member of the casino called then would be responsible to help provide for the community at large. Perhaps he would work on an irrigation canal. Perhaps he would be asked to redistribute food. There are over 300 individual identifiable casinos. Now let me explain the word a little more. I'm using the word Katsina, K-A-T-S-I-N-A, rather than K-A-C-H-I-N-A, which you have seen in the literature. The reason for this is Katsina is not a Pueblo sound. There's not a C-H sound like church or chili in Pueblo language, so T-S is more appropriate, so I'm calling them Katsinas. Now, the word applies not only to those little cottonwood root figures that we miscall dolls. They're not dolls like Barbie and Ken. They are carved representations of spirit beings. So Gatsina also refers to the spirit of a departed person, and it refers to the of a new marker. It refers to the the mask and costume that a guy puts on when he assumes the, the personage of that departed spirit. Now I say a guy. Virtually all casinos are, are male. If a woman really wants to be added to a casino cult, she can do so. An easy way is to save the life of a casino guy and you usually get added to his cult that way. Or, or you can work toward it. But let me tell you, it's not worth it. Women in Pueblo society have a lot going for them without being casino members. First of all, Pueblo society is matrilineal. Everybody figures his clan membership through his mother. And they're macrolobal, which means that when a guy marries, he would go and live with his bride and her family. And here's the good news, ladies, women own all the property. 
And if you want to divorce a guy, I want real property he can, you simply put it out the front door when he comes home for the deal. Sign on, Bill, whatever. Okay. So these pendo clips that again are here is an effect into the stone, and we have here the whole panel. So we need to draw your attention to the board briefly. And uh, the first thing I want to mention up here is cosmology. These Pueblo and people have a different cosmology probably from most people. Cosmology simply has to do with the theory or philosophy about the nature of the universe. How did things come to be what they are? Is there a God? Is there more than one God? Where did I come from? Why am I here? All this has to do with cosmology, the creation of, of order out of chaos. These people are also specifically animistic. Animism is the belief that natural objects are alive, that is, they have souls. And therefore, if you wanted to cut down a tree for a purpose, you would probably make an offering to that tree for sacrificing itself to your need. Likewise, a stone or anything else. <coughs> Shamanism, then, is the doctrine or belief that spirits can be influenced. These Pueblo people, so this is a belief system that's shared throughout Asia, even today. These people believe that it is good to have in the community a person who specializes in interacting with the spirits. So we would call him a shaman, and many of the petroglyphs were generated by shamans uh, as, as a ritual activity. But there are other, other things that uh, can generate petroglyphs. The least frequent, fortunately, the least frequent petroglyph type you will find is graffiti. I've just drawn a little face up there. Some Hopi shepherds have said that, yes, when we were kids out here with the sheep and we were bored, we would put graffiti on the rocks. We did generate some petroglyph graffiti, but the most petroglyphs that you will find will fall into one of these other categories, either uh, as recorders, such as recording an individual death, like the explosion of the supernova uh, in AD 1054, and that's usually marked by an exploding star, which was seen close to the crescent moon. That supernova event was so bright that it could be seen during the daytime. You could see it in the daylight sky for two weeks. We know that because the Chinese who were in the writing by that time recorded that. Uh, there was another uh, supernova uh, later on. So you can record an event as a petroglyph. Uh, many of them are markers, like I was doing over here, as a clan marker, where the, the sand clan or the badger clan or the turkey clan left their markers. Or these two guys are nautical petroglyphs. This, uh, this pair represents the, the warrior twins. Elder brother is marked by the bow, and the younger brother, he was south of the water, is uh, marked by this little hourglass symbol. Another kind of petroglyph then would be ritual, and this is most of what the shaman got involved with. Uh, ritual magic, suppose you want to go out and put a big one sheet, the shaman would go then and uh, he would pray, make an offering, and generate a petroglyph pertinent to that. So you find this also in the Caves, the cave art in uh, Spain, Santander, and Lake Puerto Prayer, and uh, what's the name of the other one? I'm trying to think of Altamir, and all of those. And that stuff dates back 30,000 years, that kind of, of ritual shamanism for uh, hunting. Now, there are several forms of, of petroglyphs. Those that are human like, of course, are anthropomorphs. And uh, you want to pay attention when you're looking at them to know whether they're standing or whether they're floating, which would be kind of a, of a dream or trance state where the person is not in a right mind, if you will, but he is he's actually in a, in a, in a spiritual uh, boat. Uh, even the Apostle Paul talks about having gone to the third level of heaven in his Corinthian letter. Uh, you want to pay attention to the gender of the individual. Most of them are male, but some are definitely female. Uh, what's the uh, figure doing? Is it just standing around or is it acting out in some way? Zoomorphs then are, are animals. They might be game animals, they might be totemic animals, like in this case uh, the badger is a totemic animal. Uh, they might be a messenger animal, like a snake or a snappy, or a parrot, and how all those are, are messenger animals. 
Sometimes they're simply geometric, in which case they are symbolic. This pair of, of interlocking steps is specifically the symbol for the Hopi Pachi or Cloud House or Water Plant we have for all those things. This is a very, very old symbol. You find it as a petroglyph and you also find it on pottery. Another geometric is very common. It is the spiral. Uh, all of us always they're counterclockwise, but sometimes they're clockwise. And uh, they have a number of meanings depending upon their context. Usually they simply represent emergence. The Pueblo and cosmology is that people used to be below ground, below the surface of the earth, and uh, they have come through three below ground existences to this above ground for the world. And uh, where they came up above ground, from below ground, is this exit place here is called the Sipapu. You'll see it as Sipapu in the literature, but Sipapuni, Sipapuni is uh, correct if you're dealing with Hopi. So, uh, another kind of geometric you might find is one that can be interpreted as corn. It's like uh, the rose on here of corn. If you find the same symbol, but there are dots in the middle of each little square, then you're, you have an aerial view down on Pueblo. Those are the entrance holes in the, in the rooftop of the Pueblo. Parallel lines usually represent uh, uh, irrigated or farmed land. So that's just a small fraction. When we get the lights off, we will continue with these. How are we doing on time here, Bill? How much stage we got left? We got about uh, 13 more minutes. Susan, well, we'll take care of that. Okay, meanwhile, back in our particular panel, uh, you recognize this stand as Sand Clan or Venus or Kessel Coatl. We recognize this as one of the 300 Cassina masks. And uh, this as a snake, which can have a wide variety of interpretations. He can be snake clan. He can uh, be a messenger animal. Uh, he can be a marker for the location of a stream, because snakes are associated with water as well as the underground. But we have some footprints on here, and they can indicate direction. <coughs> There's also this one that has six toes. And the six toes is probably a representation of reality in a small breeding isolate, say the Amish, for instance. Polydactyly, that is the, the occurrence of an extra finger or an extra toe, is a, a, a real phenomenon in a small breeding isolate. So I suspect this six toed footprint represents a six toed person. And uh, here we have our spiral in, and because it's associated with a snake, which is the way it's drawn, is indicating the direction of a spring. Uh, there's a spring uh, directly here. And uh, we also have this, which to me looks like uh, a kernel of corn, but anthropologists being what they are, you know, anything that's uh, agreeably associated with sex is attractive to an archaeologist or an anthropologist. There are those who interpret this as female genitalia, but if you pay your money and take a chance on that one. Now, I haven't yet said anything about current problem identifications of these things. Some of these symbols that I will show you have a very broad meaning, uh, and some are very esoteric. Depending on whether you ask the Hopi or Zuni what you're looking at, you will get a different answer. I have done both. This is identified as a member of the Two Horn Society, or a member of the Antelope Clan, depending on who you ask. And this is identified as a member of the Corn Clan. Here would be the roots, and here would be the, uh, the big leaves on the corn. Or, it's identified as a spirit being, depending on who you ask. So I want to uh, alert you uh, that there's not always agreement amongst the tribe about what, what the identification is. And this, of course, is very familiar being your Coca-Cola, who has uh, his antennae up here if you want to identify Coca-Cola as, as being a, an insect uh, related to the, the cave yet, where he has a humped back. And antennae, or you can think of those as being feathers, and this backpack full of, of seeds or trade goods. And, of course, he's playing a flute. He has a, a barely discernible 
uh, Venus, but Golden Dolly usually is represented as uh, being well endowed in that respect because he is, after all, identified with fertility. And this one can be identified again as a member of the corn clan because it looks like a deer of corn, or others identify it as uh, a butterfly symbol because of the antenna on the head. So what they've done is identified the mature butterfly head with the, the immature or a caterpillar body. And that's it, folks. We'll continue Monday where we left off today. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. been listening to The Hour of the Time, I'm William Cooper. Tonight's broadcast was taken from a lecture done by Miles Gilbert of the Round Valley, an archaeologist, on May the 28th, 1998, at our annual conference. If you didn't make it, you missed five days and nights the most incredible, informative, educational experience that you could possibly imagine. Listening to 101.1 FM Eager, classic radio like you always wished it could be. 101.1 FM Eager is your non-profit community service radio station. Be sure and tune in tomorrow at the same time for the hour of the time with yours truly, William Cooper. We now return you to all oldies most of the time. Only the very best of the very best music of generations gone by. Thank you.